On today's show, the Houston Rockets are making some big moves ahead of the NBA draft, trading the Nets picks back to Brooklyn for the future of Phoenix Suns picks. Could Kevin Durant or Devin Booker be next? Why Houston made this deal, what it means for the future. Was this a good or a bad trade? It's all coming up on today's Locked on Rockets. This is Mission Control, Houston. Ignition sequence start. Six, five, four, three, two, one. Oh my. Mikhail Bridges finally traded, but it wasn't to the Houston Rockets. What's up and welcome to another edition of Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. As always, I'm your host, Jackson Gatlin, native Houstonian and credentialed media member. I'm also the host of Locked on NBA Mondays. Be sure to follow along wherever you listen to your podcasts or on YouTube. Just search Locked on Rockets. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. That's the best way you can help us out. Go comment anything below. Give me your your instant reaction to this trade. I'm still trying to wrap my head around it. We're going to we're going to tackle what this trade means, whether it's a good or bad deal, trying to unpack so many different angles from it on today's show. Even if you swing by, just come say go Rockets. It helps us out a ton. The YouTube comments, they're great. Now, today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. This summer, FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a boost or a bonus daily. That's right. There's something for everyone every day. All summer long, visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. And as always, thank you so much for making Locked On Rockets part of your day every single day, whether it's on your way to work, on your lunch break, in the gym. Thank you for being an everydayer. The Houston Rockets are making some moves. Rafael Stone in the Rockets front office being very active just 24 hours, a little under 24 hours ahead of the NBA draft. And man... This was a, talk about some whiplash. This was like to live through this moment, to get the Woj bomb notification that Mikhail Bridges was traded to the New York Knicks for a mountain of first round draft picks and then to immediately have this like just high of, oh my God, the Nets picks are worth so much right now. And then to have that swept away to realize that the Rockets had dealt the Nets picks back to Brooklyn in exchange for future Phoenix Suns picks was, I'll be completely honest, a little bit deflating. But as I was able to sit with it, wrap my head around it further, and try to make sense of things, I do believe that this deal is a deal for the future. It's a better long-term deal for the Rockets. And we're going to walk through this together. So first things first, let's go through how this was all structured, how it all came about, and then we'll get into, you know, the specifics of what this means for the team going forward. So first off, I think it's important to view this trade as not two separate deals, but as one kind of very convoluted three-team deal. So the original framework, the original, the first domino, if you will, was we got the news that the Nets agreed to trade Mikhail Bridges to the Knicks for Boyan Bogdanovich, four unprotected first-round picks, a protected first-round pick via the Bucks, and an unprotected pick swap and a second-rounder. That is a ton of draft capital for Mikhail Bridges. So the reason this trade happened was because I'm guessing in principle, right, the Nets had agreed to a separate trade with the Rockets behind the scenes. They were not going to get rid of Mikhail Bridges unless they were able to get back their own picks. And so the Rockets have now given up the 2025 Nets swap, so they've relinquished the rights to that swap. They've also given the Nets back the 2026 first round pick outright. So the Nets now have control of their own draft capital, of their own future for the next two years. Yes, that means the Cooper flag draft. That is next year's draft, the 2025 draft. More on that here in a second. And the Rockets, in return, essentially, the, the easiest way to think about it is they they basically traded one swap, one pick swap, and one unprotected first-round pick for two additional pick swaps and two additional unprotected first-round picks. That's kind of the lay of the land. And again, it, this deal 
does not happen, or the, the Mikhail Bridges trade with the Knicks does not happen unless the Rockets agree to this trade with Brooklyn behind the scenes. Because again, Brooklyn was digging their heels in, and the only reason they weren't willing to trade Mikhail Bridges in the first place was because they wanted to remain competitive, they had zero incentive to tank, and so there's no way, there's not a chance in hell that Brooklyn does this trade unless they know for certain that they're getting those picks back from the Rockets. So the way that it works, right, Sean Marks hits up Rafael Stone, they start talking, then they agree in principle. They're like, hey, if we find a deal for Mikhail, are you guys willing to give us back these picks? Rafael Stone and the Rockets say yes. They go out, they source, they find the deal for Mikhail Bridges. The Knicks are willing to pay through the nose for it, which, side note here, the Knicks are going to be scary good next season. Adding Mikhail Bridges to that team, you know, and then getting everybody healthy, whoo, man. Also, Mikhail Bridges is like the, like, I don't know, a one number one like Iron Man in the NBA. So seeing like an unstoppable force and Mikhail Bridges hit an immovable object in Tom Thibodeau and like his rotations and him like grinding players into dust is going to be a very interesting dynamic to watch play out uh, next season in New York. But I don't want to get too far off the beaten path here. That's why this trade happened. Okay. So I need everybody to wrap their head around that because, you know, again, I was very excited for a split moment there thinking, oh man, these Nets picks are going to be incredible now. That's not the case. That's not how this trade worked. There's no way that the the Knicks and Nets made this move. And then the Nets were like, hey, Houston, so can we get our hands on those picks again? No, not how it worked out whatsoever. So to break it down, just as a, you know, looking at the Rockets updated kind of first round draft pick stock, right? They didn't give up this year's pick at all. They still have the third overall pick in this year's draft. In 2025, they have the better pick of Phoenix's or OKC's pick. That's what they they have swap rights in there. In 2026, they only have their own draft pick. And that's only if it's if it lands in the top four, which hopefully, let's be honest, if the Rockets are that bad and they land a top four pick, then something has gone catastrophically wrong. So 2026, essentially, they don't have a first round pick. 2027, they have the better of their own pick or Brooklyn's pick in 2027. So they did retain the 2027 pick swap, which is actually a really impressive uh, asset now, considering the fact that Brooklyn is is openly willing to bottom out now. They've still got Cam Johnson to trade. They're, they're getting ready to fire sale everything. So the Nets are going to be bad for, at a minimum, Two years, while they have their their own control of their draft picks, 2025 that the Rockets gave back, and now 2026. But that 2027 pick swap is still going to be incredibly valuable because the Nets are not, there's not a chance in hell the Nets are going to be a, a good, respectable team after two years of being an awful team. There's still not even a guarantee that they win the Cooper flag sweepstakes, right? They could bottom out for two straight years, just like the Pistons have been doing, and they could still bottom out a third year in a row and be one of the worst teams in the NBA. So that 2027 pick swap has an immense amount of value now. In 2027, they also own a Phoenix pick outright, So two picks in 2027. In 2028, they have their own draft pick. In 2029, they have two first-round picks, the best two out of Houston's own pick, Dallas's pick, or Phoenix's pick. So they have swap rights in there, and again, they'll get the best two first-round picks out of Houston, Dallas, or Phoenix. Then in 2030 and in 2031, they own each of their own first-round draft picks. So that's kind of the updated lay of the land for what the Houston Rockets have as far as their draft war chest, their draft capital after this trade was made. And again, the the easiest way to look at it is they traded one swap and one unprotected first round pick from the Brooklyn Nets, 2025-2026, for future for two future pick swaps and two future unprotected first round picks via the Phoenix Suns that the Brooklyn Nets owned um by way of their Kevin Durant trade. So this is now the second time Two times uh, that the Houston Rockets have kind of bet against the future of a Kevin Durant led team, which is, you know, not a lot, but it's kind of weird that it's happened twice, right? If we had a nickel for every time that the Rockets bet against a future of a Kevin Durant led team, uh, the Rockets would have two nickels, but that's kind of weird that it's happened twice. So that's kind of the breakdown of how the trade came about, how it all looks, you know, trying to update everything on paper. We're going to get into 
why Houston made this deal, what it means for the future. Does this mean they're going to be pursuing Devin Booker and Kevin Durant or Kevin Durant next with these draft assets? Not quite. We're going to break it all down for you coming up here in just one moment. First, today's episode is brought to you by eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. The formula for winning championships is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. Superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and so much more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed, guaranteed, to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to make your car the MVP. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay guarantee fit only available to U.S. customers. And continuing on here at Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. All right, let's keep breaking down this Rockets-Nets trade. Now the Rockets, instead of owning the next three years of Brooklyn Nets draft capital, they own one more year of Brooklyn Nets draft capital, and they've essentially flipped it for uh, future Phoenix Suns draft capital. So, uh I, I it bears repeating here, but again, this trade doesn't happen unless the Mikhail Bridges deal it, you know, or the Mikhail Bridges trade doesn't happen to the Knicks unless the Nets agree in principle to this trade with the Rockets. So we've hashed that out. And, and look, I, I think the best way to view this trade is kind of as a, like, I've seen people refer to it as a, a quantity versus quality type trade. And I, I, I agree with that to an extent. Um, obviously, the quality of that 2025 and 2026, those Brooklyn assets could have been really, really good, especially if Brooklyn continued to be rudderless and, you know, stuck in the treadmill of mediocrity. But again, I always cautioned against this, and, and I've I'm a bit on record talking on this show about this. The Nets were one halfway decent trade away from those picks being late teens, early 20s at the best, right? They were teetering in that middle ground of the treadmill of mediocrity. And all it was going to take was one bad move from, from Sean Marks and the Nets front office to cash in all those Suns picks, which again, league wide are valued as some of the best picks in the NBA because the Suns are in a very turbulent situation right now with an aging Kevin Durant, a Bradley Beal who looks really bad and is locked in for a long-term deal with a no trade clause in his contract. Uh, a situation in which the Suns didn't even crack 50 wins and didn't win a single game in the playoffs just now, this past postseason, and a young Devin Booker who is probably itching to get out of a bad situation in Phoenix. Like, that situation is a powder keg ready to explode, and now the Rockets are banking on the downfall of the Suns instead of banking on the downfall of the Nets. And the Suns are in a much, much worse position than the Nets were in a couple years ago. So... I like this trade from that perspective. Um, and again, trying to look at it as a way of their, them kind of diversifying their assets. Yes, they're going to miss out now on, you know, what could have been a potential premium asset, uh, the pick swap in the Cooper flag draft. But again, I never was, I was never one to put all my eggs in that basket in the first place. I didn't like the idea of banking on that one possible outcome of like, oh yeah, and, and I get that it's a deeper draft. I get that there's more players than just Cooper flag in that draft. But I think this is evidence of the Rockets mentality moving forward. The fact that they are very much shifting gears into more of a win now mode, right? There's only so much developmental runway that you can have for these young guys. And for, as it stands right now, and I, I, I was, you know, I, I confirmed with a team source uh, in the aftermath of the trade who said that they, that we shouldn't read into this being connected to anything else as it relates to what they're going to do with the third overall pick, all, all this stuff. There's not... I, at least as it stands right now, I do not believe that there is another subsequent move in the immediate, you know, horizon. It's not like they 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 didn't make this move to then immediately flip these picks into another star player immediately, right? This is kind of them kicking the can down the road a little bit, maintaining flexibility, maintaining optionality, 
And I think, honestly, the biggest factor here is while there are some future long-term possibilities of pursuing guys like a Kevin Durant or a Devin Booker, if things start to spiral and go poorly in Phoenix or another star player for that matter, uh, this to me feels like a, a patience play because again, the Rockets have a very exciting young core six already in place. They're about to add another member to that young core with the third overall pick. It does not feel like the Rockets are going to be trading that pick. Now there's two ways to kind of read into it maybe the Rockets are in asset accumulation mode where they are still hell-bent on trading out of pick three and trading down on the draft or trading out of the draft completely to recoup additional future assets to add to their war chest of the now tons of Suns picks that they have control of. So that is a distinct possibility that they could go that route where they just want to continue to diversify their assets, spread things out, kick the can down the road. They're comfortable with the young players they already have, all that stuff. The other way to view it is this is their final chance to add one more young premium asset, get the best player available in the draft. Now, whether internally they view that as Donovan Klingon or Reed Shepard, whoever's on the board at three, they take the best guy available. They have that seventh piece of the young core. And then that's the final person. That's the final piece that they draft. And that's the last guy that they're planning to add to the young core, grow, develop, nurture, all that, despite the fact that there's not a ton of developmental runway available here in Houston quite just yet because the rotation seems pretty stacked as is that's that's kind of the way to view this i think um and again my my belief now is that they're going to just stay put at pick number three they'll draft whoever's there um again i still think the organization is leaning clinging if he's on the board um over reed shepherd but i'm I personally for me i want to see reed shepherd in a rockets jersey i think he makes so much sense as the pick for houston um I think the the patience angle here to consider is really important. And I think it's about giving the young core, mo more specifically giving Jalen Green and Alperin Shingoon another year to kind of show whether they're good enough to be that tier one, one A superstar or superstar duo that, Rockets fans hope they can become, right? Alper and Shingun had a sensational year three, took a massive leap forward. How much better can he get this next season? Same thing with Jalen Green. It was a disappointing two-thirds of the season, and then he came on in a massive way in the month of March, really kind of post-All-Star break, and had a fantastic close to the season, right? Can those two guys level up one more time this next year and make the Rockets feel confident that, yes, we are we are confident in these two being our two franchise superstars going forward. We're con we are confident in their ability, and we're going to sign them to long-term, rookie-scale, maximum extensions because we feel confident about what they're doing. I don't think we're going to see extensions for Jalen Green or Alperin Shingoon this offseason. I think the Rockets are very intent on running things back next season and giving basically this entire group one more year. You know, they've got one more offseason under Ime Odoka. They'll have one more year next season to make a push to prove that they have it, right, to see how much better everybody gets after one more year, one more season, and then evaluate in the aftermath of the 2024-2025 season, right? Because guess what? If Jalen Green and Alper and Shingun take that leap, and if they look like the superstars we hope that they can become, and if other guys continue to get better, Jabari, Tari, Amin, Cam, if the course, and then whoever they draft at three, right? Shepard, Klingon, whatever. The young guys are all going to grow and get better. If the Rockets already have their 1A superstar or superstars in-house, then they don't have to worry about trading for one. And suddenly, those Nets picks, or the, well, I apologize, the Nets pick that they have left, the 2027 pick, as well as the future Suns picks, become a pipeline of young talent that they'll be able to have, even if they're just middle, you know, mid-tier lottery picks, late first rounders, whatever, they'll be able to then focus on drafting young quality prospects to be able to offset the financial dilemma that they're going to be in by paying big money to guys like Jalen and Shingoon because they're going to be, you know, moving into that next tier of NBA contender where finances become a major issue as they're 
giving out rookie extensions to their young guys and starting to pay, figure out which guys they're going to pay and who their core pieces are going to be and who are the, the, the building blocks of this team moving forward. So that's one way to view it. The other way to view it is if things don't work out, if the Rockets don't have a 1A superstar, because you need a 1A superstar to win in the NBA. You need a top 20, top 15, top 10 guy to be able to win at the highest level. Hell, it helps if you have two of those guys, but you need at least one of them to be competitive at the NBA level. If Jalen Green and Alperin Shingun don't grow into that type of player one day, one of them at a minimum, then the Rockets are poised now in a fantastic, they're in a fantastic position to package one or two or three, however many they would need of their young prospects, the young, exciting players on the roster, plus a bunch of that future draft capital, some combination of the Suns picks, that Nets pick that they own, and their own future draft capital, like like just load it up like a confetti cannon and blast it at the next top 10, top 15 guy that becomes available. Right, So I, I view this as a play where the front office and, and Rockets Brain Trust, the Brass, Ime Odoka, and company, they're all playing a game of patience right now where they want to see what this young core has, what they're capable of, and they're going to reassess a little bit further down the line. At this point, I do not think they're going to do anything with that third overall pick. I think they're going to stay put. I think they're going to draft one more young guy, and that's going to be how the draft night kind of winds up for the Rockets. But... The other angle to consider here is the future angle, right? Could the Rockets get involved with the Phoenix Suns down the line and make a trade for one of Kevin Durant or Devin Booker? We're going to talk about that as well as final thoughts from this trade here in just one moment. First, today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Look, I love sports. I love them so much, I never really want them to stop, right? Discussing this stuff, these trades and everything, I I love it. Just inject it right into my veins. But as you've got postseason winding down and you get fewer and fewer games and the sports aren't quite sportsing the way you want them to, look, FanDuel lets you keep the sports going whenever you want. All you have to do is open the app and dream up big bets anytime you're in the mood. And this summer, FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a boost or a bonus daily. That's right. There's something for everyone every day all summer long. Right now, you can head over to FanDuel.com and take a look at the outright betting favorites in this year's NBA draft. Right now, Zachary Reese still the favorite to go number one overall at minus 390. Number two overall, Alex Sar, a minus 750 favorite. That seems like the locked in pick at number two. And then number three, Reed Shepard, still the favorite to go to the Houston Rockets at minus 210, but not far behind him is Donovan Klingon at plus 260. So for all those odds and so much more, head over to fanduel.com slash locked on and start making the most of your summer. Fanduel, official sports betting partner of the NBA. And final segment here at Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. All right, so let's take, uh, let's scale things back out even further and take an even longer term view of this overall situation. So very, so first, first off, actually quick aside here, I am just so glad, I am so glad and so happy. I'm about to, I'm about to shed a tear on the show that we no longer have to talk about hypothetical uh, B- Mikhail Bridges trades with the Brooklyn Nets. Like I, we have been released from this torment that has plagued this show and Rockets fans for what feels like an eternity. And no more do we have to hear about any hypothetical Mikhail Bridges trades or rumors of the Rockets reported interest in doing this kind of stuff, all that stuff. Yeah. So just thank goodness that that's all done. Um, I, I do also want to highlight here and give a lot of credit to, uh, the Houston Chronicles, Jonathan Fagan, who reported this back in May that the Rockets had been pushing to trade with the Nets and to trade the Nets' own draft capital back to Brooklyn in exchange for some of the Phoenix Suns picks. This was a conversation that they had around the NBA trade deadline. Uh, I'm sure it was had in some version, some permutation of those Mikhail Bridges discussions that the Rockets had had or had you know had taken place with the Rockets and Nets in the past. Um, and so Jonathan Fagan the number one guy on this Houston Rockets beat. He is the most plugged in guy. Um, and he was on this from the beginning. So I wanted to give a lot of credit to Jonathan Fagan for that, having the initial scoop on this and just being, you know, in general on top of Rockets news, like he always is. Um, now the issue here is, and I, I brought up the Mikhail Bridges 
trade hypotheticals and all that, because unfortunately the Rockets are potentially going to find themselves in that exact same boat with the Phoenix Suns potentially a little bit further down the line. Now, I said already that this trade does not mean, like like my understanding of this is the Rockets are not about to turn around and try and poach one of Kevin Durant or Devin Booker from the Suns immediately. Now, is that a play that they could consider making down the line? 110% absolutely. Uh, as it stands right now, the Nets are, or sorry, not the Nets, sorry, I'm all stuck on Brooklyn. We're done with Brooklyn. Forget about Brooklyn. We don't care about Brooklyn anymore. The Suns, uh, that's our new, we're, we're, that we're preoccupied with the Suns now. That's our new focus. That's our new favorite. Uh, that's our new schadenfreude target, if you will. So, so instead of now watching Nets games and hoping that the Nets lose every night, we are now on Suns pick, pick watch territory. So now we've got to start paying attention to the Suns and hoping they lose a ton of games. But, um... They are fully convinced they're going to run things back with their current core. They're going to make tweaks. They're going to make adjustments, whatever. They're trying to run things back with Budenholzer at the helm. Uh, whether that works out or not is kind of very up in the air at this point, right? The Suns are like a, a whatever, a tower of playing cards ready to you know be knocked over, blown over at a moment's notice. Um, I do not expect... Any of the core that I, I don't expect either Kevin Durant or Devin Booker to be on the move this offseason. They, they are fully committed to going back into the season with both of their stars in tow and Bradley Beal um, and trying to figure that situation out in Phoenix. Now, depending on how catastrophic the season could go for the Suns, then maybe we start hearing discussions as early as the NBA trade deadline, like six months from now, whatever, seven months from now, halfway through the season about the Suns wanting to tear things down or trade away KD or Devin Booker and bottom out and all that. And the Rockets are now going to be in prime position to negotiate directly with the Suns and be like, hey, you guys, you guys, you guys looking like you guys want to tank? Well, guess what? We own your draft picks. So if you would like to tank, we would like one Kevin Durant or one Devin Booker, please and thank you. Uh, I will say that uh, as it stands right now, KD is not, um, I, I don't know. I, I am not excited at all about the idea of adding a, what, 35, 36 year old Kevin Durant to this Rockets roster. I know he's still one of the best players in the NBA right now, but he's, he's, he's so much, he's older. He's not even on the wrong side of 30 anymore. He's on the wrong side of 35. Like, and you know, how many more years is KD going to be an elite player at this level? Like, I don't think the Rockets would be, I don't think it would be advisable for them to cash in on what's going to feel like a very, very, very long title contention window, assuming they're able to keep a majority of this young core together and, and grow and develop everybody and, and keep the core six core seven together, as well as putting little, you know, uh, complimentary pieces around them and whatnot. It doesn't feel like shortening your championship window by cashing in those picks for, you know, a 36 year old Kevin Durant for two seasons is the right move. Now I will say Devin Booker, who is currently 27 years old um, and has a lot more, is, is basically entering his prime right now as we speak uh, and is on, you know, I wouldn't say a team-friendly contract, but is at least locked down for the next four years. If there's a reality somewhere down the line where at this upcoming trade deadline or a year or so from now or two years from now, whatever, there's a very realistic pathway to where you can see the Nets potentially trading KD for whatever they can get for him at that point in his career with one year left on his deal, two years left, a year and a half, whatever it would be, a rental, if you will, from a championship contender. Um, and then potentially them turning around immediately and saying, all right, Devin, you're headed to Houston. We're going to trade you for one or two of the Rockets young guys. Plus, we're going to get back some of our son's picks. And sorry, but that that's just how this thing is going to wrap up. So I do think that is a distinct possibility much further down the line, but I don't expect it to become a possibility this offseason. I, I think at the earliest we could see rumors or rumblings about the Rockets engaging with the Suns to pursue one of their two-star players. Again, I, I would hope it'd be Devin Booker, not Kevin Durant. Uh the earliest I think we see any any reports or rumors about that is going to be this upcoming trade deadline. I know Adrian Wojnarowski put out that tweet saying that the Rockets are going to turn their attention towards Kevin Durant. Um, and I can also confidently say that that's not the case. That, that 
yes, there have been moments where the Rockets front office have been intrigued by the idea of pursuing Kevin Durant historically in the last, you know, year or two. Uh, but there's they're not in a position right now where it feels like the right move. And again, everything that this front office have done, everything that this organization has done from ownership to the front office to coaching to the way that they've handled players and transactions screams they are willing to be patient. And I think that this organization deserves a ton of credit for that. Um, now, there is something to be said for maybe some mild concerns of the idea of kicking the can down the road and and basically shying away from making any any big trades right now. But I do think that in the future, like the long-term outcome of these assets have a chance to be just as good, if not better, than the way that we viewed these Brooklyn Nets draft assets, right? These Nets assets already turned into, for the Rockets, they got pick 17 and Tari Eason. They're about to get pick number three and whoever they select there. That is a fantastic return for the two Nets assets that you did ultimately cash in. And again, now you have all those Suns assets to continue either having a pipeline of young talent, uh, potentially, you know, picks at the top of the lottery, depending on how bad the Phoenix Suns are, you know, a year from now, two years from now, four years from now, whatever. Uh, and then on top of that, again, having all that draft capital to be in prime position to make a play for a superstar player down the line. Because what, even if it's not Kevin Durant or Devin Booker, um, if the Rockets choose to not deal directly with the Phoenix Suns, these draft, ca- these draft picks are going to be viewed very favorably by the rest of the league. And a year from now, two years from now, if, however many years from now, the Rockets could be in a position where maybe, you know, one of Jalen or Shingoon becomes their 1A option, right? And nobody else quite gets up to that level, but the Rockets have a bunch of really good complimentary players like fringe all-stars, whatever, solid role players. Then they're in the position to be able to pair whoever does ultimately become their superstar of their young prospects they're able to then go out and package a few of the other young guys and pair another superstar with that player. So when when this trade first happened, it took me a little bit to wrap my head around it. It took me a little bit to work through my understanding of it. But I really walk away thinking that this was a fantastic move by the organization. It sets them up for beautiful long-term success. And here's another funny part is contractually, The Rockets are actually set up amazingly. If somebody, if a star player shakes loose this season, the Rockets have so much expiring salary at this NBA trade deadline. They've got, as expiring salary this season, Jock Landale, Jay Sean Tate, Jeff Green, Steven Adams. That's like $37, $38 million of expiring salary. You package all of that with like one piece of the young core that gets you up to a, you know, $45 million, you know, total that you could swing for whichever upset star player wants to trade mid season. If that's the way the Rockets want to go. In addition to all those contracts, they also have Fred Van Vliet, who is technically on an expiring deal and his deal is massive. Right. So if there's a trade out there where the Rockets are like, oh, man, well, we can't we can't aggregate all five of these contracts in the middle of the season, because unfortunately, midseason trades, you have to go one for one on players. You can't trade five players for one player in the middle of the season. You have to match bodies on a roster. The you know, whatever team you're doing the trade with has to be able to absorb all those contracts or immediately cut or waive the players that they're receiving back. Um, Maybe there's a world where the Rockets look to deal Fred Van Vliet at the trade deadline because he's got a massive contract, 40 some odd million dollars. And that could be a nice one for one deal that they make at the deadline. Maybe they draft Reed Shepard and he's ready to take over the reins halfway through the season as the starting point guard of the Houston Rockets. Who knows? The possibilities are quite literally limitless for this Houston Rockets team. The future is incredibly bright. We don't have to talk about Mikael Bridges anymore. And I'm really excited by this trade. I want to know how you feel about this trade. Let me know in the YouTube comments. Do you feel better about this trade after what we discussed on this episode? Was I able to rationalize it enough for you and and encourage you and, and get you excited about the future of this Rockets team? Let me know your thoughts in the YouTube comments. 
But as always, thank you so much for checking out the show. If you haven't done so yet, please consider subscribing wherever you listen to your podcasts or on YouTube. Just search Locked on Rockets, like, comment, subscribe, all that good stuff. And if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, a five-star review helps us out a ton. But as always, thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for listening. And we look forward to having you back right here at Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball.